This video is brought to you by MUBI, an online cinema streaming hand-picked exceptional films from around the globe. Get one month free at MUBI.com slash LikeStoriesOfOld. Quietly done. It's a four-day journey to the other side. Let us hope that our presence may go unnoticed. When the Fellowship is trying to find its way through the minds of Moria, Gandalf comforts Frodo by revealing the existence of a higher authority guiding his fate. There are other forces at work in this world, Frodo, besides the will of evil. Bilbo was meant to find the ring. In which case, you also were meant to have it. And that is an encouraging thought. It is the first real reference to a godlike presence in The Lord of the Rings, a notion that is not to be overlooked as it implies that the characters act within the context of an unseen force working towards its own purpose. A second reference to the existence of this force can be found when Gandalf fights the Balrog and reveals himself to be a servant of the Secret Fire. I am a servant of the Secret Fire. The Dark Fire will not avail you. Flame of Uldun! To understand what this presence is and how it affects the story, we must briefly turn to Tolkien's Silmarillion, the expanded mythology on the creation and history of Middle-earth. Here we learn that the Lord of the Rings takes place in a universe created by a single god, here named Eru Ilúvatar, meaning the One and Father of All. Ilúvatar created the Ainur, his angelic spirits, and all the living beings in Middle-earth, and kindled within them the secret fire also referred to as the flame imperishable, which can be seen as the gift of an independent existence, containing self-awareness and most importantly, free will. The flame imperishable was the greatest gift given by Iluvatar, because, as Matthew Dickerson writes, it is this freedom that enables them to participate in Iluvatar's music, and to themselves assist in subcreating new beauty. In fact, so great a gift it is that none other than Eru Iluvatar himself can give it. His sole ownership of the Flame Imperishable came to the great envy of his most powerful Ainur called Melkor, who, similarly to Satan in John Milton's Paradise Lost, wanted to replace his creator and take away the gift of freedom. He desired rather to subdue to his will both elves and men, envying the gifts with which Iluvatar promised to endow them, and he wished himself to have subjects and servants, and to be called Lord, and to be a master over other wills. He became Morgoth, the first Dark Lord. As you can probably guess, his chief lieutenant and representative character in The Lord of the Rings is Sauron. Although this barely scrapes the surface of the Silmarillion, it already reframes the central conflict in The Lord of the Rings into one with greater cosmic significance. For Tolkien it was obvious that ultimate power only belongs to God himself, and so he writes, in The Lord of the Rings, the conflict is not basically about freedom, though that is naturally involved. It is about God and his sole right to divine honor. Sauron desired to be a god king, and he was held to be this by his servants. If he had been victorious, he would have demanded divine honor from all rational creatures and absolute temporal power over the whole world. In other words, it's a war for the soul of Middle-earth, a fight to remain under Iluvatar's grace to keep the flame imperishable burning in the hearts of every living creature, and not fall under the dominion of a corrupted angel seeking absolute power. Let's return to the Fellowship. Now that we have a better understanding of the cosmic forces at play in Middle-earth, we can revisit the importance for our characters to achieve a moral victory over a physical one for no longer is it a struggle with their own conscience. It is also a reflection of the spiritual warfare between Iluvatar and Morgoth. This is important because it adds moral objectivism to the world of Middle-earth, meaning that there is a predetermined concept of what is considered good and what is considered evil, based on higher forces than ourselves. Striving towards a moral victory therefore not only suggests choice, but also responsibility. As we've seen, this responsibility is complicated by the fact that every character is endowed with the flame imperishable, and is thus free. Iluvatar's creations are not compelled to do good. 
As a consequence, having the courage to resist evil becomes a great virtue, but failing to do so also becomes possible. In short, the Lord of the Rings presents a world wherein good and evil are absolutely distinct, but not one wherein good and evil people are absolutely distinct. Yes, there is weakness, there is frailty, but there is courage also, and honor to be found in men. Tolkien believes that there's a little good in the worst of us and a little bad in the best of us, but not that there's a little good in evil and a little evil in good. He believes in human moral complexity, but not in logical moral complexity. This moral complexity is probably best exemplified by Boromir. We see in him the great nobility and courage of men, but as the son of Denethor, he is also strongly affected by his father's material view on victory and desire for power. The weapon of the enemy has been found. This thing must come to Gondor. And so Boromir too wants to protect Gondor at all costs, even if that implies using the enemy's weapon. It is a gift. A gift to the foes of Mordor. Why not use this ring? He is therefore more tempted by the ring than the other members of the Fellowship, and eventually succumbs to its evil. It should be mine! Give it to me! This, however, does not make him unredeemable, quite the opposite in fact, for the presence of the flame imperishable also allows for salvation. It is true that in a material sense, Boromir has failed. He failed to protect Frodo, he failed to return to Gondor, and he even failed to save Merry and Pippin. In the end, he suffers the ultimate physical defeat. But again, in the battle for the soul of Middle-earth, it is the spiritual victory that truly matters. Forgive me. I have failed you all. No, Boromir. You fought bravely. You have kept your honor. So how is it that Boromir received his salvation? For starters, he realizes he has committed evil and apologizes for it. What have I done? Please. And while his attempt to rescue Merry and Pippin fails, it does show his willingness to sacrifice his own best interest for that of the Fellowship. It shows that he chose to fight the evil that for a moment took the best of him, and it is in that choice that Boromir achieves his spiritual victory. A choice that cements itself when he, with his dying words, fully steps outside of his father's shadow, and accepts that he plays but a small part in a greater story. I would have followed you, my brother. My king. By now it is probably clear that the freedom that allows moral choices is most valued in Middle-earth. So what does this mean for the role of Iluvatar in The Lord of the Rings? How does he intervene in the story without compromising this freedom? How does he ensure his beloved creations do not fall into darkness? The first way he shows his guiding hand is by providing the Fellowship with a guardian angel in the form of Gandalf. Gandalf is one of the Maiar, the lesser angelic spirits of Iluvatar, sent to Middle-earth in mortal form. Because Iluvatar does not want to compromise the freedom of his creations to make their own moral choices, Gandalf's powers are limited. His main purpose is to guide the characters on a spiritual level, not fight their battles for them in the physical realm. I come with tidings in this dark hour, and with counsel. That is why we only see him use his magical powers against other higher beings who are corrupted by evil. For example, when Saruman corrupts the king of Rohan, Gandalf uses his magic to release Theoden from his spell and rekindle the flame imperishable, thereby restoring his freedom. Gandalf, breathe the free air again, my friend. After that, however, Gandalf only serves as an advisor, because ultimately it is Theoden himself who must take the responsibility to make the right moral decisions and restore his spirit. We must face the long dark of Moria. Gandalf also serves an important role in guiding Frodo, and it is through his teachings that we get a better sense of the values that Iluvatar wishes for his creations beginning with the importance of mercy. We've seen Bilbo spare a golem out of pity, but in The Lord of the Rings, Gandalf explains why this was the right thing to do. It's a pity Bilbo didn't kill him when he had the chance. Pity? It was pity that stayed Bilbo's hand. 
Many that live deserve death, and some that die deserve life. Can you give it to them, Frodo? He wants to make it clear that we should not be quick to pass death as judgment, for not even the very wise can see all ends. Our perception is too limited to commit an act of such finality. And as we see later, Frodo has taken his advice to heart as he, just like Bilbo, shows pity towards Gollum. An act of mercy that, as we all know, will eventually decide the fate of Middle-earth. Maybe he does deserve to die. But now that I see him, I do pity him. But there's more to Gandalf's words than this rather logical argument for showing mercy. For although we've been focusing on what is within the power of the characters, their free will, choices and virtues, Gandalf also points out what is not within their power. As previously discussed, Tolkien separated the pagan virtues from the glorification of war and death in battle, for those require a specific outcome in the physical world, be it a military victory or a glorious death. And such outcomes are not for us to decide. That power only belongs to Iluvatar. Only Iluvatar can see all ends. Only he can determine the ultimate fate of Middle-earth. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. Iluvatar's hand is however not directly perceivable to the characters, or to us for that matter. At best it is shown through what could be considered lucky events. It is in this way that he can intervene without compromising the freedom of his creations, as Matthew Dickerson writes, Iluvatar's intervention does not remove the significance of the choices made by the children of Iluvatar, but in many ways it can redeem those choices. Or, to put it in another way, the characters are responsible only for their own choices, and not for the outcome of those choices. They are responsible for the means, while the ends are in Iluvatar's hands. The Lord of the Rings is filled with chance encounters and coincidences leading to outcomes of such great importance that one could argue that they were guided by Iluvatar's hands. But this intervention becomes most obvious at the very ending, when Frodo, after all that has happened, famously fails to destroy the ring. He is attacked by Gollum and, after a brief struggle, they fall over the edge and the ultimate evil ends up being vanquished by accident. Tolkien coined the term eucatastrophe to define this sudden hand of fate, which to him was more than a deus ex machina, or a simple happy ending. It was pure grace, the ultimate salvation for the courage, mercy and selfless sacrifices of Iluvatar's children. Because this one is not in time, he can make something in our past as well as in our present affect the future. The salvation of Middle-earth and of Frodo is achieved by Frodo's and Bilbo's and Sam's and Aragorn's and Faramir's previous pity and mercy to Gollum. It also reasserts the theme of moral victories being more important than physical victories by showing us again what is within our power and what is not. It is within us to be brave, merciful and virtuous, and that is what Tolkien wanted to emphasize. Frodo deserved all honor, he writes, because he spent every drop of his power of will and body, and that was just sufficient to bring him to the destined point, and no further. But it is not within us to see all ends, to decide our fate, Remembering that this was a battle for Iluvatar's sole right to such divine power, it becomes understandable that the final glory of the physical victory against Sauron belongs to him, and him alone. The nearly miraculous outcome leaves the reader no room for pride or self-righteousness, as many happy endings do. Tolkien deliberately ended the story with the eucatastrophe, not to detract from the achievements of his heroes, but rather to emphasize what drives us through hardship and suffering, and that, ultimately, is the belief that no matter how bad things get, there's no darkness greater than the light. There is always hope. Mr. Frodo, look, there is light beauty up there that no shadow can touch. The Lord of the Rings takes place in a pre-Christian world, which is why we don't see any characters praying for miracles or divine intervention. We don't see them praising or worshipping Iluvatar. And this was important for Tolkien as he didn't want the story to be allegorical, he wanted it to be mythological. 
He wanted it to reflect a deeper, universal truth. The difference is best explained in his own words. I think that many confuse applicability with allegory, but the one resides in the freedom of the reader, and the other in the purpose domination of the author. We find this applicability in the simple fact that although one can find and be inspired by Iluvatar's existence, it's not necessary to believe in or even know about his presence to reach the same deeper meanings of the Lord of the Rings. What matters is that Iluvatar's flame imperishable, his divine light, his hope, exists within the hearts of all his creations. Therefore, what ultimately drives them is not a faith in God, but a faith in each other. And this, I believe, is where we get at the very essence of Tolkien's work. We've discussed how the ring's evil is isolating. It creates a darkness of everlasting conflict, betrayal and loneliness, where vulnerability is punished and all hearts turn to stone. But therein lies its greatest weakness. It cannot open its heart. It cannot be vulnerable. And thus, it cannot hope. For hope does not depend on the power of one, but on the bond between all. That's why Galadriel specifically tells the Fellowship that hope remains while the company is true. They can face evil as long as there remains love and friendship between them. And such qualities are not about taking, they're about giving. We find it in the small acts of giving gifts, a mithril vest, weapons and tools and even fireworks that bring joy to old friends. And we find it in the larger sacrifices, in giving aid in time of war, in keeping a promise despite the consequences, and in giving loyalty and support on an impossible mission. Interestingly enough, even the quest to destroy the ring is an act of giving, because whereas most stories are about conquering or acquiring something, the Lord of the Rings is about returning something, about giving back the evil that does not belong in this world. It is in these acts of sacrifice, be they great or small, that characters find hope. When times are dark, however, it may seem like a mistake to hope for such selflessness, as it depends, as Tolkien describes it, on the behavior of an individual in circumstances which demand of him suffering and endurance far beyond the normal, demand the strength of body and mind which he does not possess. Indeed, as the shadow of Mordor extends over Middle-earth, and the days are increasingly filled with despair, it may seem like such hope is only reserved for the foolish. There never was much hope. Just a fool's hope. And yet, if the Lord of the Rings shows us anything, it's that this fool's hope is not so foolish at all. It is truly powerful. There's still hope for Frodo. We can give him that. The power of hope is beautifully visualized when Pippin lights the beacons of Gondor to send a distress signal to Rohan. It shows how even the smallest person can kindle hope within the hearts of many, and how one small act of courage leads to a force great enough to conquer evil. It captures how, time and time again, characters strengthen each other's spirit through courage and kindness, loyalty and friendship, from the encouraging speech of a king to the bravery of a soldier. From a great diversion to a few drops of water, hope spreads itself over Middle-earth, inspiring everyone to stay strong, to keep fighting. For Frodo. And so while there's no hope for divine miracles, there is hope for goodness, for courage and for brotherhood. There is hope that our friends will not abandon us in the face of great evil, that they remain true when all hope seems to be lost. And it is this hope this fool's hope that ignites a fire across mountains and brings the story to its fateful ending. As Aragorn becomes king, Middle-earth ushers into a new age of peace. But the victory is not everlasting, no victory over evil is. Eventually Aragorn will die and his legacy will slowly fade away. Darkness will find its way into the world again and the entire struggle begins anew. And that brings us back to the importance of mythology. As Frodo closes the book on the Lord of the Rings, his adventure becomes a story. His story becomes a myth. And that myth becomes a source of inspiration for countless generations yet to come, ensuring us that no matter what darkness may rise, there is always hope. But above all, the Lord of the Rings shows why we need such stories. Stories that form a mirror to our hearts, that tell tales of friendship, love and trust, 
and affirm that hope is and will always be more resilient than any force of evil. To end with a quote from the Orphean passages. In order to comprehend the experience we are living in, we must, by imagination and by intellect, be lifted out of it. We must be given to see it whole. But since we can never wholly gaze upon our own life while we live it, we gaze upon the life that in symbol comprehends our own. Art presents such lives, such symbols, myth especially, persisting as a mother of truth through countless generations and for many disparate cultures, coming therefore with the approval not of a single people, but of all. Myth presents, myth is, such a symbol, shorn and unadorned, refined and true. And when the one who gazes upon that myth suddenly, in dreadful recognition, cries out, There I am, that is me, then the marvelous translation has occurred. We are lifted out of ourselves to see ourselves holy. Now that this story has come to a close, it's time to start exploring new ones. However, with so many films out there, it's not always easy to find those that are worth watching. And so I was really glad to have discovered MUBI. MUBI is an online cinema streaming a hand-picked selection of films from around the globe. Every day they present a new film, and every day they take one away. Whether it's a timeless classic, a thought-provoking documentary, or an acclaimed masterpiece. There are always 30 perfectly curated films to discover. It's a simple but highly effective way to start exploring the riches of cinema. And I'm happy to share this with you by offering 30 days for free. So head on over to movie.com slash likestoriesofold to begin your extended free trial today.